The New Level Cap Podcast is a show about fun, friends, game design, and all things otherwise. Your hosts are Marco DeSantos and Brad Talton of Level 99 Games. I'm Chris Solis, your producer, and without further ado, please enjoy the show. All around me are familiar faces and lonely places. Welcome to the New Level Cap Podcast with me, your host, Marco DeSantos, also known as Mechanic Critic, and with me is a very special guest, no one. This is a Level Cap Podcast where I will be by myself. I don't have a special guest today, but don't worry, we still have a wonderful docket for you tonight. Actually, let me start off this episode with a question. Anonymous asks, When you create a new season of Exceed, do you try to balance the characters within the season only, or across all Exceed characters? Now, this was a very interesting question, and I was planning to do a mailbag episode today. However, since I don't have a guest, and I kind of been wanting to talk about this topic for a while, I've decided to create an entire episode dedicated to a guide. A guide I've been wanting to make, but haven't had the time or resources to create an entire blog post or video about. So, what's better avenue than using the podcast to get a guide into your hands? So. Here's Marco's five-step guide to making characters for Exceed or Battlecon. Alright, so we've touched upon a lot of the things that we at Level 99 Games do to create a character for one of our fighting card games. So whether that's Exceed or Battlecon. And we'll end up answering the question that Anonymous asked near the end of this episode. However, we have to start from the beginning. Step number one the experience. We've talked about delivering experiences before in a previous episode of the podcast. However, that doesn't just apply to whole games in themselves. It's not just whether or not Millennium Blades makes you feel like a card game player, or Battlecon makes you feel like you're actually playing a fighting game. The big thing here is that experiences are things that characters also provide. And in fact, It's probably the most important thing you have to consider when making a character. Now, here's something that I want to make very clear. The character's experience is not the character's playstyle. Now, I think this is better illustrated in an example. Alright, so let's say that when I ask what my character's experience is, let's say, uh... I want a defensive counterattacker with a resource that gives them even more defenses. Does that make sense? Alright, do you think this is a wonderful experience? Or is this simply a mishmash of mechanics that allows them to, you know, function in the game, but it only makes sense to people who are either designers of the game or people who have already made characters for the game before? Because I could also just say, hey, my character is a unfeeling robot that can tank through anything and then hit like an absolute truck in response. There's a big difference between these two kinds of statements. One locks you in to a certain set of mechanics. Okay, so you have to counterattack, so you have to have a resource, so you have to gain more defenses. And one simply tells you, hey, this is what the player who's playing this character should feel. An unfeeling robot can shrug off hits and hits like a truck themselves. This is the big difference between these two kinds of statements. And I feel like a lot of people make the mistake of going for the first one. They want to lock themselves into mechanics. They want to lock themselves into a specific playstyle. When really, the point of making a character is to provide a fun experience. And therefore, how the player should feel when using your character is everything. Because mechanics can come and go. But if your mechanics don't make the character feel like the way you want them to feel, then you've failed. Besides, the first definition is not even really that clear. Because a defensive counterattacker who can spend a resource to gain more defenses could easily apply to Cadenza, who's that unfeeling robot I was talking about before. It could also easily apply to Elagor, who is a precise counter-attacking Templar who blocks things with his shields and then hits you back with a sword. And it could easily also apply to Vincent from Exceed, who is, for all intents and purposes, an evil corporate president 
that I have no idea about the lore of Red Horizon um, exactly because I just know that Vincent is an evil president. Um, but the point is that that description applies to so many characters and it doesn't really tell you anything about what you'll feel or what kind of experience the character provides. Because I don't need to tell you that playing Elagor and playing Cadenza and playing Vincent are all very different experiences. Because Cadenza feels like a lumbering robot and Elagor feels like a precise counterattacker. And Vincent feels like, you know, like a monster final boss who supposedly just walks into bullets. Overall, all of these characters have a very similar mechanical um, definition, but a very different experience when delivered. So remember, when making your character, make sure that you have the experience in mind, as this will inform everything else. So throughout this episode, let's try to have an example character so that I can use somebody as an example. Uh, let's say we want to create an unstoppable monster who charges at opponents and doesn't care about their own life. There you go. So this character wants to just attack and attack and attack. Whether or not they get attacked in return is irrelevant to them. All right, so let's call them the Rampaging Berserker, because I feel like that's kind of what captures the essence of this character's playstyle and experience. The player playing this character should feel like they're a rampaging berserker going through the fight with little to no finesse. They go in, they attack, and whether or not they get hurt as a result is irrelevant to them. Number two, take inspiration. So let's be real here. There are over 100 characters in Battlecon, and around like 50 to 60 in Exceed, depending on whether or not you want to count Exceed Shovel Knight, because it's not necessarily out yet. So, chances are, if there's anything you've wanted to make in Battlecon or exceed a specific kind of effect or a specific kind of playstyle, no doubt, it probably already exists. You know, you want to make a agile fighter who dodges attacks? Well, there's like three of those. There's, there's <laughs> Demetras, there's um, Schecter, and there's um, Darius. So there, there's at least three characters who all do that in their own unique way, but they all do it. Now, many people will look at this and feel very disappointed, right? Because they'll feel like there's no more room to create something new. Because they think that's bad. They think, oh man, I made a style, but wait a minute, Kadath already has that. I made a special, oh wait a minute, Minato already has that. Aww. And they get frustrated because nothing they make seems to be anything different. But I want to try telling you all something. That's not a bad thing. Having a template or having things to copy or having things to take inspiration from is really, really good. Because think about it. Have you ever actually tried creating something from absolutely nothing? Like from a blank slate, from nothing. Number one, if you said yes to that question, you're lying. Because if even if you made a card in Exceed and tried your best not to copy anything, you're still tr taking inspiration from something in the game. You wanted to have a specific range because of X. You wanted to have a specific power because of Y. So there's literally no way to take something from nothing. So you might as well roll with it. So... These characters that are already made have cards, stats, effects, etc. that are good templates to, for the lack of a better term, steal. Because there's, nothing absol there's absolutely nothing wrong with taking something that already works and adapting it for yourself. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, so what? So every character is just a remix of another character? Man, that's boring and people will see right through it. Like, so many characters in Balkan are unique. How do you do it? Well, let me talk you through a specific character. Let's talk about Burgundy. Burgundy is a character who is very unique because his ability is that he can't actually attack from his own space. He himself never actually calculates his attack ranges from his marker or from his stand-up. Instead, he has to do it from his paint markers that he splashes all over the board. This creates a very unique playstyle because hit confirm that is based on movement is not useful to him. So drive, even if he drives, 
he doesn't actually gain bonus range from it, since he has to calculate his range from a stationary marker regardless of his actual position. However, on the flip side, this means that cards that usually have poor ranges, but great stats like Strike or Grass, become really good because if he positions his markers correctly, they actually get extended range. Now, this is a very unique character. Literally nobody else in Battlecon plays like Burgundy does. Except for the small little detail that Burgundy's entire gimmick is lifted wholesale from an effect that has existed since the first copy of Battlecon. Tatsumi has a style that lets her calculate her range from her Juto marker's space instead of her own. So, it's very simple to see how taking something that already exists and putting your own unique spin on it can easily create a vastly unique character and a wildly different playstyle. Because, look, even if Burgundy's entire kit japed that effect from Tatsumi's card, Burgundy plays nothing like Tatsumi does. So, in the end, don't be afraid to take inspiration. Now, for our raging, rampaging berserker, it might be very good to look at characters that have mechanics that either make them lose life, to, you know, em exemplify the ability to not care about your own life, or look at characters who um, build up and then become uncontrollable, like Caesar. So, uh, you might want to look at characters like Hepzibah, Schecter, or Caesar for inspiration for this rampaging berserker character. I know I will. Number three. Keep it simple, silly. Like I said in the previous point, you want to just basically take something and then put your own spin on it. But there is a danger when doing that. In my many years playing Battlecon and working on Battlecon, uh, people have sent me many custom characters. And in fact, people have sent me a lot of Exceed custom characters as well. And here's one thing that I feel like they always fall into, and it's the complexity trap. So, okay. I want to make it very clear. There's absolutely nothing wrong with complexity. And even if this point is called keep it simple, silly, there is nothing wrong with creating a complex card. But you must create a complex card with a purpose. So, many people end up giving me cards and effects and characters that have four paragraph unique abilities, three paragraph card text, etc, etc, etc. A lot of wacky card effects and a lot of long-winded and complicated effects. And when I ask them, why does this character do this? They simply say, because it would be too simple otherwise. Or because if I didn't do it that way, it would look exactly like this other card. Like I said in the earlier point, there's absolutely nothing wrong with just wholesale taking certain effects or wholesale taking certain stat lines from other cards. They they exist in that form for a reason. They've been tested and they're tried and true. The thing about doing this philosophy is that if you simply create complex or long-winded effects just to make your character seem different from other characters, then you'll end up with a really bloated character with a lot of effect text that doesn't really matter and a lot of effect text that don't ultimately go back to the first point, which is the experience of your character. Okay, let's talk about an example. Let's talk about a rampaging berserker. So in your mind, it might be very awesome for your rampaging berserker to do a shoulder tackle move that hits the opponent so hard, they hit the wall, and then they bounce off of it towards the rampaging berserker again. So many people would probably want to do something along the lines of, well, on damage, you want to push the opponent for each point of damage you deal. Then if the opponent is at the edge of an arena, pull them equal to the amount of spaces they were not pushed. Now, think about it. Conceptually, that's something a rampaging berserker would do. They'd push someone so hard because they hit them so hard that they bounce off a wall. Great. But imagine the player experience. Remember, everything should serve the player experience. What does an effect like that make the player feel? Does that make them feel like a big hulking monstrosity that just punched someone like a semi-truck into a wall? Or does it make them feel like they're doing algebra in the middle of their game? Because even if you can justify the thematics in your head, the actual experience of playing that card feels less like Rampaging Berserker and more like high school algebra. Because you have to do, oh, X is 5, alright, and then I pull this number of spaces. The Berserker doesn't care! 
The Berserker punches you and then you go into the wall. What happens to you after that is not the Berserker's deal. He doesn't care. So, the Berserker, wouldn't it be better if your Berserker just did, I don't know, push per point of damage dealt. If the opponent's at the edge of the arena, they take three more damage. That's it, right? You hit the opponent so hard, they bounce off a wall and then it hurts them. This is more in line with what your Berserker wants to do, as opposed to this weird movement effect thing that nobody really cares about. So, at the end of the day, it's very important to understand that creating effects is not bad. Complicated effects are not bad. But try to keep things simple, because simplicity is often the result of a lot of testing, a lot of iteration, and a lot of careful thought put into the effect. Now, if your effect ends up being complicated afterwards, after you've put a lot of care, thought, and testing into it, then that's fine. But to simply default into a complicated effect because you want to emulate something is wrong. Remember, simplicity is very, very important, especially if you're making your first character. And simplicity is often the result of well-thought-out effects that serve your character's play experience. So, keep it simple, but... Don't be afraid of making complex effects, especially if you put a lot of thought into them. Alright, so I'll move on to the next two more points after the short break. So I'll take you to a short break and you can come back and we can finish up this point and hopefully answer the question that we posed at the start of this podcast. Yar, ye be looking for treasure? Well, (coughs) well, we're selling treasure boxes. Each box will include one game or art book valued between $10 to $200, three smaller promotional items, and a signed prototype component from Level 99 Games' illustrious gaming history. Each box is only $12.95. What a steal! (laughs) This deal ends November 12th, so head over to our store by clicking the link in the description down below or at the end of this video to get your piece of treasure before the pirates steal it. Yarr, with prices like these, who needs to plunder? And welcome back. In case you missed the first half of this episode, we're talking about Margo's five easy steps to creating a character for Exceed or BattleCon. Now, in the first few steps, we talked about creating your character's concept and how to make their cards. And in the last two steps, we're going to be talking about testing and iteration. Let's start off with testing. So, this is where we start answering that initial question that was posed at the start of the podcast. Once your character's cards are made, you got to test them because that's just that's just how things work. Even if it looks great conceptually, certain things can only be found out if you actually play the card and actually play the character. Now, it's important that your character becomes balanced and fun. Remember, fun. Fun is the important thing here. Balanced and fun across a wide variety of characters. But remember what I said earlier on? There's like a hundred characters in BattleCon and like 60 characters in Exceed. How how will you ever have enough time to test your character against everyone? Let alone test them more than once against everyone. Because remember, even if you only fought against each character once, that's still a hundred or maybe 60 games. So this is where benchmarks come in. Now, for people who have listened to older episodes of the podcast, you'll probably already know this. Benchmark characters are simply put the representatives of a specific playstyle or archetype. There are many archetypes and playstyles in Balcon and Exceed, and we could spend years debating over their specific definitions, who, who counts as this, who counts as that. But it doesn't matter because the characters who are benchmarks are the representatives of those archetypes. They basically define the archetype by existing. So for Battlecon, this would be characters like, say, Cadenza for Juggernauts or Heavies, Rukyuk for Ranged Fighters, and Hikaru for Brawlers. And for Exceed, it would be something along the lines of Zangief for aggressive melee characters, Sagat for keep-away zoners, and Chun-Li for defensive positioning characters. Overall, it's very hard to debate that these characters don't represent those archetypes. Uh, Though they might not have all the tools that all the characters in those archetypes have. For example, Cadenza doesn't have a counter style like Elagor does, who is also a heavy. and 
um, Sagat might have less mobility than a character, say, like Cyrus, it's still very important to understand that they represent the archetype enough that you're comfortable with saying, ah, if my character has a decent time against this, he probably has a decent time against everyone. So, for example, my Rampaging Berserker needs to be able to test properly into counterattackers. Because if the counterattackers deal more damage than him, then he's probably gonna lose. But Rampaging Berserker probably needs to test into long-ranged fighters like Rukyuk or Sagat. So that's your answer to the original question. We don't necessarily test within the season, and we don't necessarily test across everyone. In fact, we make use of very useful benchmark characters in order to have wide reach in terms of our testing, because we need to multiply the effectiveness. We don't have hundreds of testers working for us 24-7, so we have to make do with what we got. However, benchmarks are not foolproof. They have their own problems. And like I said earlier, benchmark characters don't necessarily have all of the tools needed for their character archetype to work. Or they might not have all the tools that some of the characters in their set archetypes have. So for example, in Battlecon, there was a character named Voko. Voko is essentially what amounts to a ranged character. He has a lot of minimum ranges on his attacks, which means that if he's in melee range, he can't actually hit the opponent. Now, this did fine against a lot of characters in the Brawler archetype. These are characters who effectively function at many different ranges, but they're more comfortable in melee range. So, you have a character like Hikaru, who was tested for that. However, another character that's kinda in that vein would be somebody like Zamasal. Zamasal can work from ranges 1 to 3 and has a lot of ways to give himself small bonuses to make up for the fact that his average stats are mediocre. He can do a lot of everything, but not one thing particularly well, much like Hikaru and his elemental tokens. However, Zamasal has the Paradigm of Haste. The Paradigm of Haste is a very powerful card, as it allows Zamasal to permanently give himself this effect. Opponents adjacent to Zamasal cannot move. And this becomes a really big problem when your character's cards are all minimum range. Ha! It's very obvious to see that if Zamasal just did Paradigm of Haste into Voko, uh, Voko would never be able to hit Zamasal, and Voko can't do anything about it, resulting in what many would say is a completely unwinnable matchup for Voko. So, the project lead and the lead developer have to stay vigilant. Because they have a big understanding of the game, they should know which particular kinds of stat lines and character kits are susceptible to certain effects. And it's their job to make sure that the testers know to test that matchup. Because again, benchmarks are good, but they're not foolproof. Now, for our Berserker, our Rampaging Berserker, we need to make sure that they get tested against all the benchmarks. Against all the benchmarks. Um, And if you want a specific list of benchmarks, I'll probably like just have you go into the Discord or ask the community because the benchmarks have indeed changed over time uh, and it's not really particularly clear. But here's a quick example, right? Uh, so for Battlecon, you probably want to test your character into Hikaru, Cadenza, Rukyuk, Kalistar. That would probably be a simple set of four characters you want to make sure that your character does decently against. Then... We might want to go to Exceed and make sure that your character tests well into Zangief, Chun-Li, Sagat, and Ryu, right? Make sure that your character tests well into them, and you're probably golden. However, there are certain matchups that I would probably want my Berserker to look into better. So since my character is a rampaging Berserker, and a lot of their cards are probably, um, you know, they eat up a lot of their own life or have really uncontrollable effects, you might want to test the character into heavy, heavy control characters like Eric from Battlecon or Umina from Exceed. These characters might have tools that make it so that your character, the Rampaging Berserker, is actually impossible to play. So watch out for that and try to test into those characters. Now, after you've tested your character and you've gathered enough data, you're probably going to want to do step 5. Iterate. Once you've tested your character, you might find a lot of things you want to change. You might notice that after playing the Rampaging Berserker into Rukyuk, you say, uh, he probably doesn't have enough ways to deal with characters who can move around the board a lot. If you test it against Omina, you might go, uh, my character has not a lot of ways of dealing with somebody who can negate all of his big payout attacks. So, we're thinking, what 
can we do? This last point is dangerous. Very, very dangerous. Because this is where a lot of pitfalls happen. When you iterate your character, there are two bad things that can happen. Number one, you can buff. And number two, you can nerf. Why are these bad things? Aren't these things that you usually want to do? Yes, but bad things can happen as a result of your buffs and your nerfs. Let's go with buffs. One thing that can go wrong with providing buffs to your character is you forget point number one, the experience. Now, a lot of characters in the game would have better matchups if they had an extra thing. So let's talk about the Rampaging Berserker into a ranged character, for example. Well, my Rampaging Berserker can't seem to hit this guy who keeps teleporting to the opposite side of the board. I guess a simple fix to this would be to give him a card that gives him a lot of range so that he can hit at long range. I'll stop you right there. Does that sound correct to you? Does the Rampaging Berserker, this hulking behemoth of a character who's supposedly charging towards the opponent constantly, would it make sense for them to shoot projectiles from full screen? Would it make sense for them to throw rocks at an opponent instead of, I don't know, charging towards them? When buffing your character, always make sure that your buffs stay true to the experience you want to provide. Maybe instead of adding more range, we could just give the character a effect that moves them closer to the opponent, whether that movement is fast as a start of beat, a before activating, or an end of beat, or in exceed, maybe we can just make it so that the opponent can't move. So when you play this card, the opponent can't move and it gives time for the Rampaging Berserker to come in. Either way, these are better options than simply giving your character a projectile move that doesn't make sense and doesn't fit their fantasy. This brings us to point number two, nerfs. Now, I'm not talking about the designer nerfing a card on the character. No, 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 no. I'm talking about unforeseen nerfs. See, sometimes when we create effects or sometimes when we create uh, changes for our characters, they inevitably end up interacting with something else in a way that we never really imagined. So, for example, when we wanted to fix that inability to hit a character that can teleport, Rampaging Berserker now has a lot of awkward movement. An advance 3 or maybe an effect that says advance 4. In either way, this makes them really susceptible to one thing. Characters who want them cornered or characters who lay down traps, right? Because you don't have control over that positioning. You advance four and you advance that much, right? You don't get as much control as a character with, say, advance one, two, three, or four spaces. So when the designer sees this and they realize, oh shucks, this effect makes it so that I can miss my attack if I'm at range one and then I advance four spaces. Oh no! Okay, so I have to change it to advance 4, but instead, if you would advance past, you don't. So it becomes close 4 instead. Yeah, that way we fix it. That way we fix it. Stop. Stop. Designer, stop. What you've done is the second pitfall that people fall into. What's so bad about your character having that weakness? Think about it. A fun and balanced character is not a character that just does whatever, and then always works. You get it? That might be a balanced character, but that's also a boring character. Wrinkles. Wrinkles in your game plan. Effects that don't quite work the way you want them to. Situations where your character finds themselves in a disadvantage. That's what makes a good and healthy character. Because if your character just works all the time, regardless of whatever happens, then not only is it not fun for your opponent, who probably just keeps losing, it's also not fun for you. Because no matter what you do, your character succeeds. It therefore is no longer a reflection of your own personal playstyle or your own skill, but rather simply the character autopilots itself. Because even the most autopilot characters like Cadenza in Battlecon have wrinkles. Cadenza might just have stun immunity and can just deal a lot of damage, but he can easily get out positioned, and a good cadenza player is one who can reposition themselves while attacking. So, do not try to get rid of these small things that make your character quote unquote nerfed, because they are part of your character's identity just as much as your character's strengths are. Again, a ranged character is not really fun to fight against if they're just as good in melee as they are at range. It's 
it's boring and it just means that your character can do everything and doesn't really give your character a fun or meaningful identity and experience. At the end of the day, you want to make sure that your changes still adhere to the main experience that we talked about in point one. So for the Rampaging Berserker, it's very, very good that we just gave them an advance four because they're uncontrollable and they're not necessarily the most graceful character. But it also does double duty by making it so that your matchup against ranged characters gets better if you use the tool correctly. So that's the end of this episode of the New Level Cap Podcast or also known as Marco's 5-Step Guide to Creating Characters for Exceed and or Battlecon. This has been an episode of the podcast, or a a guide that I've been wanting to make for months, for years even, uh, because I feel like it's a very useful thing for people to understand. Because not only does it give them a tool by which they can make their own characters, it gives you, my dear listener, an insight into how characters in Battlecon and Exceed are made. And we've gone through that topic a lot of times, but we've only in small snippets. I feel like this episode is very good for me to collate all of that data and put it into one episode for everybody to listen to. So hopefully this helped you out. Did you like this episode? Did you have any more questions about my points? Please put them in the comment section down below. Maybe you disagree with some of my points. Maybe you think, nah, the experience doesn't matter. Well, tell me in the comment section down below and we can talk about it. Again, thank you so much for listening to this episode. I really, really appreciate it. And I really appreciate all the amount of time you've spent uh, listening and interacting with me. Now, if you wouldn't mind, please give this a like or give us a review on iTunes or on Spotify or wherever you find your podcasts. And if you love this episode, share it with a friend. And if you hated it, share it with an enemy. As usual, that's been me, your host, Marco DeSantos, also known as Mechanic Critic, and with me has been no one but you, my dear listener. And thank you so much for listening. Don't forget your special action, and thank you, World of Indians. Thank you, and good night. The new Level Cap podcast is produced by Level 99 Games. Join us next Wednesday for more design talk and shenanigans. Thank you for listening.